Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome watch, all of you watching online. If you would, stand with me and hold your Bibles up and your phones, whatever you have. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment and uh, share with you that this past week, uh, Pastor Jesse, who preached last Sunday, who is my dear friend and brother, his mother went to heaven uh, on Valentine's Day, and uh, they had been kind of expecting her to pass into heaven, and uh, she did indeed in her 90s, so she lived a long life, and uh, nonetheless, it's a loss, and it's, it's painful, so please be praying uh, for Pastor Jesse and his family, his like 13, 14 brothers and sisters. It's amazing. I promise you his mother is in heaven. She got some kind of, you have that many kids, I, I think you just go. I mean, I, I know that theology doesn't fly, but anyway, it's, she had to be a special lady, so be praying for him. Also, uh, women, do not forget this Wednesday night. Uh, to be at the Bethmore Bible Study. Over 100 women are already signed up to be in attendance. Uh, my wife Susan will be leading that, and along with some, uh, some other ladies uh, uh, helping along. That be, there are actually women. I found out that there are several things women uh, must do. Number one, women go to the restroom collectively in groups. Uh, I, I've learned that. And then also women cannot have a church gathering without having food. Uh, and so there will be food here, and uh, so you can just show up, and it's going to be a great evening. Uh, I'm coming to kind of hide out and just kind of experience it. To me, Beth Moore is one of the best Bible teachers I've ever heard, and so you do not want to miss this, ladies, for any reason. If there's a financial issue or question in your mind as to whether or not uh, you can attend, please do not let money stop you. Uh, we will make sure that you get to be a part of this, so uh, please be here. Also wanted to let you know that uh, our website is under construction, so any of you that have recently tried to access our website or try to watch online through the website, obviously you're watching Facebook today, uh, it hopefully will be launched, a new website will be launched this week. We've been working on it for some time, very excited about it. Okay, that's that. Now today, I want to continue this series, Killing Giants. A couple of weeks ago, I began this series uh, by talking about killing the giant of self. Most of the time, uh, we, uh, the result of our life or where we're at today is because of the decisions we've made. Now, oftentimes, we want to assign uh, the blame to other people, our parents, where we grew up, the era in which we grew up, grew up poverty, whatever, an abusive home, whatever the case may be. And certainly all of those things are detrimental to living a full, wholesome life. However, at the end of every day, we get to choose how we respond to the challenges that we've had in life. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's simple. But what I want us to realize is that uh, if we're waiting on someone else to make our life better, there's a really good chance we'll be waiting the rest of our life and it will never happen. So I want to encourage you, if you have felt like somebody else is responsible for your position in life, that today you release them from that responsibility and that you determine today to take your life back into your hands. Now today I'm going to talk about killing the giant of depression because if we don't address self, and with that giant of self, then there's a really good chance that we'll be depressed because we think there's no hope. There's no possibility of our lives being different or changed. There are some statistics that, that are quite startling. It's estimated that 20-plus million people in America alone, roughly 10% or so of the population, will be given to depression over a one-year period of time. The challenge with depression is similar to that of deception. The problem with deception is you don't know you're deceived. Oftentimes, the problem with depression is you don't know you're depressed. And it, it sneaks up on you. you don't, you're tired. You're, you're fatigued. 
uh, you're not very optimistic, you're able to go to work, you do so many things that you normally do because you, that's just what you do, without realizing that you're not happy, you're not sleeping well, you don't feel good regularly, you don't have a lot of energy. And I'm not saying everyone who feels these symptoms is depressed, but these are some of the symptoms. And I can recall a season in my life where uh, I did not know I was depressed. I really didn't because I grew up learning how to press through whatever challenges I had. So I didn't see the depression I was experiencing. And one day I was talking to a friend of mine and, and uh, it was just really a, just a very common conversation in my opinion. And I said, you know, I said, I, I found myself getting on airplanes. So I was traveling about every week. And I said, I found myself getting on airplanes, and I'd get on, and I'd put my hand on the outside as I was boarding and ask God to let it crash. Now, how many of you know that's a pretty good sign you're depressed? <laughs> and yet, I missed it because I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I, I prayed. I got up in the mornings. I worked. I, I went to bed. I did everything I was supposed to be doing, but I, I didn't realize that I was just doing it out of rote or out of habit. And so it's very important that that we address this. And in, in, in the world or the church world, uh, one of the topics that we, we fail to address, I believe, is the topic of mental illness. Now, when I use the words mental illness, some of you mean, think that means that you're really, you're crazy or something of that nature, but it's no different than having the flu, only it's a part of your soul, not your body. And oftentimes, our soul is affected in similar fashion as our body. Something happens, some seed, uh, viral seed or bacteria seed, if you will, gets into the soul and starts working against our immune system of the soul, which is we were created in the image and likeness of God, born to live an abundant life. So it makes sense that the powers of darkness will attack not only our bodies, which are oftentimes, it's very obvious, you have temperature, you know you're sick. You had a headache, you don't feel well. The soul is very difficult to identify some of those problems, honestly, because we don't want people to think we're crazy. We don't want people to think we're the only ones who have these issues. I mean, if I look around this room, according to the statistics I just read, there's a good chance, and those watching online, that, that some maybe 10%, as many as 10% of the people are fighting uh, depression which is a form of mental illness. It doesn't mean you're men mentally ill, just like you're not going to be physically ill your whole life when you get the flu, but you're experiencing a moment where your body is under attack. And so if your body is under attack, you address it. Challenge is we have a difficult time addressing our mental illnesses. One of the greatest things that's happened to me in my life was the opportunity I had to spend two years in a very extensive counseling, uh, and, and I'm not ashamed to say it, it helped me, it pointed, it revealed things to me that I didn't know I had in my life. Uh, as I talked through my issues with a professional counselor, I began to see things I'd never seen before, and it liberated me. It didn't condemn me, and so, so many times, people are afraid to go below the surface of their emotions, their anger, their hurt, their frustration, uh, for fear that they might find something they don't want to find. And that was me. I did not want to know who Mark Crow really was because I might not like me. You know, how many of you know that you kind of get used to yourself and, and you kind of get to where you like yourself a little bit like who you are and anybody doesn't like you, they're in the wrong and, and realizing that oftentimes we're the common denominator in the problem. And it's okay. Uh, we can always change. It's the beautiful thing about God. We're going from glory to glory. So never ever feel bad about feeling bad. As a matter of fact, if you feel bad, realize it and address it. So if you would, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Because the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we were tempted and yet he was without sin. What am I saying? I'm saying that Jesus himself experienced depression. He experienced it. He encountered it, but he didn't let it beat him. And so many times when I think about killing giants, I think about David and Goliath, and I may actually preach a, a sermon addressing what David had to address when he addressed his giant. 
But take this thought in consideration. If there is a Goliath before you, there is a David within you. So if you have a giant or a Goliath before you, there is a David in your life, which means that giant doesn't have to stand in your face day after day and taunt you. You can address that giant as David did with faith in Jesus Christ, our case, his faith in God, and the giant has to fall. And in Matthew 26, 34, it says, Jesus said to him solemnly, I declare to you this very night before a single rooster crows, you will deny and disown me three times. Now, we know this, that Jesus is talking to Peter in this verse. And it goes on to say, Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny or disown you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit down. Sit down here while I go over yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, he began to show grief and distress of mind and was deeply depressed. Then he said to them, my soul is very sad and deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and keep, keep awake and keep watch with me. Now, if I was not a pastor and needed three points, I would preach from that one verse. He said, stay awake and keep watch. Stay awake and keep watch. Very important that we, we stay awake. And some of you say, well, I have to sleep. Stay aware. Be aware of what's going on. Jesus is making them making a point here to them and a statement to them to be awake, keep watch. He's in deep sorrow in this moment, and he finds himself in a place of solitude pressing in to God. Sometimes one of the most difficult things that we do is to take time to stop, stay awake, stop, and seek God. We, we get busy, we get distracted, and the reason we do that is because we want to forget that we're not happy. So we stay busy. We just stay busy. We just stay busy. We go here, we go there, we go. And we think that those things that are happening are going to fix the depression or the deep sorrow that we have in our lives. When in reality, there are moments in time when we have to do exactly what Jesus did, because in my opinion, he's the greatest example that we have of how to overcome obstacles and challenges and giants in our lives. So he said, I'm going to pull away, and I'm going to encourage you guys to stay here and do the same, and let's press in to the Father. So, Let's begin with point number one. Make one good decision after another. Make one good decision at a time. To overcome depression, oftentimes there are so many things that are going on around us that we can't even make a decision. How many times have you said, well, I, I, just can't, I just can't make a decision right now? Oftentimes, that is because we are so overcome and overwhelmed by an emotional sorrow that we may not even realize we think we're just tired. Now, I'm not trying to get anybody to step up and say, okay, I'm depressed. You busted me. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm simply trying to get us to understand that it's not something we typically talk about because we're often ashamed of it. I shouldn't be depressed. Look at everything I have. So the reality is to overcome depression, to face that giant, it's like most everything else in our lives, is that first thing we have to do is go, I think I'm depressed, and I'm not going to stay this way. I'm going to make one decision at a time. Now, let's begin here, and you're going to think this is self-serving. It's really not. Everything I'm saying is to point you to God. But if you can only make one decision a week, make the decision to put yourself in a place of worship that week. If you can do it twice, do it twice. So, for instance, if you say, well, you know, I'm just too tired to go to Bethmore. I'm just too tired to go Wednesday night. This may be the very place you need to be. 
You're going to stay awake, you're going to become aware, and you're going to absorb in your soul the presence of God. And in his presence, the Bible says there's fullness of joy. So oftentimes, people say, well, I'm not going to take a spiritual tablet for a mental distress. The spiritual tablet is exactly what you need. You need God and his spirit and his presence in your life so real that your mind, your will, and your emotions surrender to the presence of God and the joy of the Lord comes in. The reality is that we oftentimes find ourselves in stress because we are uncertain of what we face. Let me give you an example. And I'm going to address this, and I, I hope it's not just me, but there are people who like to be in control. You're probably married to one. And the, the oftentimes, I, this, this really bothers me, and I oftentimes I get a little frustrated by it. If somebody calls me, and they just ask me to call them back, it frustrates me. Tell me why you called. Why won't you tell me why you called? It's, it's unnecessary to call somebody without telling them why you're calling. Typically, what it means to me is I have something to say to you, but I don't want you to know what it is, so when you call me back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on you. If your boss calls you and says, I, I need you to call me back, what's your first thought? Stress, right? Oh, my gosh, what have I done wrong? What, what, that, isn't that your first thought? Your wife calls you or your husband calls you? I need you to call me back right now. Can, all of these thoughts run through our mind. And so I'm trying to help us alleviate stress that makes us depressed. Depression will seek, just, just begin to seep in. When you find yourself getting stressed and uncertain. And oftentimes you say, well, that's just a personality thing. It's really not. Now, I know I may be given more to that, but the reality is we all like to know what's coming our way. And my personality type does not like surprises. According to the Enneagram scale, I hate surprises. I do not like them. Because at least half the time they suck. Just my theory. So be forthcoming with people. Be forthcoming. Tell them, I'm calling you because I'm really not happy right now and I need your help. That lets you know when you call them, you need to get uh, yourself prepared. So make one good decision at a time. John Maxwell says decisions help us start. Discipline helps us finish. So if you can make a decision and then discipline yourself to fulfill that decision, you will begin to find yourself getting happy because you did something and you stayed with it. Oftentimes, I believe depression is the result of unfinished commitments. Untruths. Not being honest. Depression gradually gets on us because over time we allow ourselves to operate out of our flesh nature instead of our God nature. And before you know it, we have the weight of the world on our shoulders. The tools you will learn as a part of this level of emotional intelligence will show you how to easily eliminate the emotions that prevent you from achieving what you want in life. As you eliminate your low self-esteem, And the feelings that say, I can't, I don't know how, I don't deserve it, or I can't handle it, you uncover your innate sense of I can that naturally catapults you to greater success. Consistent use of this process results in greater access to a fluid or what he calls a flow state. Now, oftentimes, not only is it Stress and uncertainty that contributes to depression, but also overthinking things. Any of you have that problem? Overthinking. Before you know it, you have a conversation with yourself that really turns into inviting the devil to sit down with you. 
making things worse. Look, the worst thing you can do to me is kill me, and then I go to heaven. How bad is that? If you think in terms of extreme extremes, nothing is that bad. Because greater is God in us than the devil in this world and all the giants that he puts up in front of us. I read this T-shirt recently. It says, uh, hold on, let me overthink this. And people actually wear the t-shirt. Hold on and let me overthink this. Oftentimes, depression is a result of us overthinking some simple issue or crisis that wasn't a crisis until we overthought it. And what does the Bible say? Cast all your care upon the Lord. Not some of your care, not, not the big cares, not the enormous cares, but cast all your cares upon the Lord. I mean every one of them. Every little issue that you and I have, we need to cast upon the Lord. The Bible also says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Your thought life, my thought life, our thought life is what opens the door to depression. Wrong thinking, overthinking, stinking thinking. All of those things open the door to us being depressed. And it is a giant in our world. It is like a $30 billion enemy that our nation fights. And 80 to 90% of the people never get treated for it, but the ones who do, they have a two-thirds success rate of overcoming depression. So I don't, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons for it. A bad marriage, your kids didn't turn out the way you want. You lost your job. You didn't get the job you wanted. You're of a certain age. You just can't see any hope in your life. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you have given yourself permission to feel horrible about life. Some success will bring some encouragement. Some success will bring some encouragement. So what I'm saying is one decision at a time, Making a decision having a measure of success will bring you a measure of encouragement. And over time, little successes add up and they become big successes. We're oftentimes depressed because we feel like we have failed or because we're failures in our own eyes. It's a choice that we make. Life is more about managing good decisions than making new decisions. Manage the decisions that you make. If you choose to do something and you commit to that, see it through to the end or the time that you've committed to it. For instance, it never fails. If a small group starts or a Bible study starts or, and there's a period of time, and this is why we do small groups the way we do them, just to let you know. We'll do small groups for an eight to ten week period of time somewhere in that neighborhood. The reason we do that is so that people can say, I can do this for eight weeks. I can do this for 10 weeks. Because oftentimes, if there is no end to something, you feel like a failure when you drop out. But let me tell you right now, those of you that commit to the Beth Moore Bible study or the eight to 10 week men's thing, you commit to it and you say, I'm going to be there every Wednesday night unless I can't be but I'm going to choose to be every Wednesday night. Why? Because now that decision is going to encourage you, and you can say, I made a decision, I committed to it, and I fulfilled it. The challenge in our world is people make promises that they never uphold. Now, we're all going to fail, but we must never, ever allow ourselves to remain condemned. You get up, if you miss a Wednesday, you say, I'll catch the next five. You see what I'm saying? Many people say, well, you know, I've already missed one. I might as well quit. You know, I think about chariots of fire. When you fall down, you can lay on the ground and you can act injured or you can get up and try to catch the pack. And there are too many people that just lay down and say, I quit. I can't get there. You know what? It's not about finishing first. It's about finishing. And Paul said, you know, I've run the race. I've kept the faith. He said, I run it. He didn't say I finished first. I did, he didn't say I'm the champion. He said, I just fought the good fight. I ran the race. He didn't say I finished for I kept the faith. 
Too often in our world, we're in such a competitive society that if we can't finish first, we quit. If we can't be the best, we stop. And that will create depression because it's not about how you compare with somebody else. It's about how you compare with the call of God and your commitment and willingness to fulfill it. Make today count. Make one decision at a time. Make today count. Every day, people will tempt you, not by design, not because they have a bad heart, but people will tempt you or you will be tempted to go back to your past. Now, some of you probably have a, a really pretty decent past. You, you know, you, 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 were, you came out of the womb and you said, Mama, just wake me up to feed me. I don't want to bother you. You were just perfect children, perfect babies. You never cried. You never, you're just angels. I, they don't want to attend here. I'm talking to the people online. I've never met anybody like that. We all have things in our past that we regret and wish we hadn't done. And let me tell you, hell has those things on file in every day. The powers of darkness and the imps that work for Satan open a file drawer, the ones that are assigned to you, and start pulling out cards or now typing it on a computer, shows up on your iPhone so that you can forget today matters. Yesterday doesn't matter. You cannot unscramble eggs. Whatever you did yesterday, all you can hope for is that you repented, that is why clean, and that you can now move forward. Everybody has a past. Some people just ain't talking about it. I'm so glad that we can't read each other's minds. We'd all hate each other. We'd look around. No, I'm just telling you right now. It is amazing what our brains think. Yeah, you, you, you've walked in today. You saw somebody's clothing you didn't like. Their hair's messed up. A sweatshirt from a, and a school that you don't like. A university, somebody's wearing orange instead of crimson. There we go. All I got to do is start a fight right here. I can just stand back and watch. Matthew 6, and 34 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If we start living outside of today, we will suffer. One author put it this way, we all experience pain, but suffering is a choice. When you get outside of today and start looking at all the things you did yesterday that you regret or you start depending on tomorrow or next week or next year to make your life better, you will suffer. But if you can stay in today, and you can live here today, and you can just look at today, you might be in some pain, but you will not have to suffer. Suffering is wishing something wouldn't have happened that did happen, and hoping that something will happen that may not happen. The challenge is that we have eternity in us and that often interferes with the temporal around us. We want things to change now. One day often seems like a thousand years to God and a thousand years is a day. And it seems like forever, but because we have eternity in us, it's very hard to reconcile the temporal around us. It's been said we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Why? Because we're created in the image and likeness of God. We were created to be immortal. And that our mortality will give way to immortality. And that we are simply spiritual beings in a human body having a human experience. Our citizenship, according to the Apostle Paul, is not of earth, it's of heaven. And so whenever things begin to look bad here, 
we have to look there. And that becomes the conflict because we know what's going on around us. And yet within us as Christians and followers of Christ, there's a different story being told. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always. Ask whatever you will in my name and I'll do it. God's given us all these promises at work in us. And then the things that are going on around us don't reconcile with what's going on in us. So we have to take what's in us and overcome that which is going on around us because what's in us is truth (sighs) it's like swimming and I think I forgot to take a breath before I went under so be a forward thinker but a today liver not like liver liver one person said if you want something out of your day you must put something into your day If you want something out of your day, you must put something into your day. So if you want peace, you put something into today that will give you peace. The Bible says he'll keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him because they trust in him. So if I want peace today, I have to keep my mind focused on him. That's what I put in today if I want peace. If I want forgiveness today and that's what I need today, then I need to make sure I forgive. You see, you can't sow judgment and reap grace. If you want grace, you must sow grace. You can't sow an apple seed and get an orange orchard, an orange grove. You can't do that. And oftentimes, people live their whole lives judging anybody. Say, what did I put in today? Judgment, but I want grace. Good luck. Let me know how that works for you. Because you reap what you sow. It's hard to find motivation in the moment when there is no hope in the future. Now, we have a future hope, and I'm not suggesting that we don't see that, but we don't live there. We live today. Proverbs 23, 18 says, There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Israel spent 40 years circling in the wilderness. They were more concerned about the place they left than the place they were going. Too often, we're trying to escape our past instead of entering the promises. Our focus is not where it should be on a day-by-day basis. And so we have to keep that focus do you really want to feel better? How many of you have ever been around somebody that you, you just can't, you can't talk them in to getting happy? You ever been around people like that? It doesn't matter what you do for them. And, and you try everything. I, I don't know how many of you used to read the comics, but back when the comics were in the newspaper, I'd always read the comics because you read everything else, you're just going to get depressed. I mean, the comic strips could be stupid as all get out, but they were better than the headlines. There was a Peanuts comic strip. Any of you remember Peanuts? And uh, where Lucy said, boy, I feel really crabby today. So her little brother Linus, always anxious to relieve tension at home. I was that guy. I was Linus. Maybe I can be of help. Why don't you just take place here in front of the TV while I go fix you a nice snack? Sometimes we all need a little pampering to help us feel better, he said. Then Linus brings her a sandwich, a few chocolate chips, and some milk. Now, is there anything else I can get you, Lucy? Is there anything I haven't thought of? Yes, there's one thing you haven't thought of, Lucy answers. And then she suddenly screams, I don't want to feel better. There are people you can give the world to, and they just don't want to feel better. They love their cantankerous self. I don't know about you, but I want to feel better. I want to think better. I want to be better. And, you know, there are just times that that somebody has to help pull us out of, pardon my Berry Hill expression here, the mully grubs. And you ever been in the mully grubs? I don't know if it's even a word, but where I grew up it was. We lived there most of the time. And so there are times you find yourself down in in despair and you need somebody to help you feel better. Now, it doesn't mean somebody lies to you. It just means that you're encouraging when you tell the truth. 
I recently had a uh, contact from a friend of mine that I was an overseer at a church, and he was having trouble with a person, and he may be watching, and I'm not divulging names, but it really disturbed me because he called me and asked me about terminating one of the employees, and I, I said, well, I, I wouldn't do it if I were you. I said, you've only been there a year, and I said, I, I wouldn't do it. I said, I think it's going to cause you trouble. Well, with the long story short, with just a matter of days, uh, he did what I told him not to do, and he was terminated uh, by the board. And now I don't say that arrogantly. I say that because I, I, I knew that the person he was wanting to terminate probably needed to go. That was not the question, whether or not that person needed to go. The way that person needed to go and the timing of that was very critical, as we now know. And there are times that you can encourage someone even by telling the truth. And sometimes telling the truth is hard. But the truth is what sets us free. And in a world that is so politically correct, I believe, my theory, that it feeds depression. Because we tell people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And oftentimes people need to hear truth, which brings light to shine into their darkness, which pulls them out of depression. And so you can look at someone very kindly and speak very gently and, and tell them a truth and say, I believe if you do this, it's going to make things better. Now, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to put up with a little bit. But if you'll just take your time and you'll just slow down and give God an opportunity to work on your behalf, you'll be surprised at what can happen. We're in a world today with social media that things happen so rapidly that we can't take them back. And if you continue to make rapid decisions without the wisdom of God, you will find yourself in great depression because the consequences are so overwhelming. So then lastly, make yourself a priority. If you want to overcome depression, one simple decision. I know some of you, it's your decision. I'm going to get out of bed today and I'm going to work. I'm going to, and, and if tomorrow comes, I'm getting out of bed today, I'm going to, uh, then maybe next week, I'm going to get out of bed, I'm going to go to work, and then I'm going to come home, and I'm going to do something else. One decision at a time that will help you, okay? And then the second point, which some of you may remember and I don't, is make today count. Make today count. In other words, live today, and then make you a priority. Now, this sounds a little millennial, because millennials always make themselves a priority, <laughs> don't get mad at me millennials but my generation we really didn't make ourselves a priority we made everybody else a priority and when we couldn't fix everybody else we got depressed I was a fixer baby boomers are fixers because baby builders taught us to be fixers you need to fix everybody because after all we fixed you no you jacked us up Quite frankly, you jacked us up. And as a result, we jacked the next generation up because we continually try to fix everybody else because we don't want to stop and fix ourselves. And you can't fix anybody else but you. And if you fix you, people want to be around you and ask you why you're so happy and you can look at them and say, because I decided I need some work on myself and I made myself a priority. I thought that was worthy of a clap right there. <laughs> Problem is, we want everybody else around us to make our world wonderful, and you're going to be depressed the rest of your life if you do that. I'm going to make my life wonderful, and I'm going to be happy, and if you want to wake up every day and act like you slept upside down in a post hole, that's your problem. I'm not even going to try to fix you. I'm just going to look at you and say you're dirty and miserable. God bless you and God bless the USA. <laughs> this is a book that came out some time ago. It says sharpen your axe. In other words, sharpen your own life. You stay sharp by exercise, sleep, eating right, being around the right people, and being in the presence of God. Amen. Sharpen yourself. Don't work so hard to impress everybody else and gain everybody else's approval because that's what a lot of people do. You're killing yourself to try to get people to like you, to approve of you, and tell you how wonderful you are. 
And let me tell you, there'll be just a dash of it, just enough of it for you to keep wearing yourself out for those few applause. Shape your life. Don't let failures, others, or your IQ shape your life. Too often we allow everything else to shape our lives. What our parents said about us, what a teacher said about us, how we grew up. My IQ was this. Somebody said this. I failed here. Instead of realizing every day is a new day and it's never too late. As one great profound manager said, it ain't over till it's over and it ain't over yet. Close with this. I might not be somebody's first choice, but I'm a great choice. I may not be rich, but I am valuable. I don't pretend to be someone I'm not because I'm good at being me. I might not be proud of some of the things I've done in the past, but I'm proud of who I am today. Real simple. And I promise you, you take these little baby steps and you'll see the giant of depression begin to crumble before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us the power of your Holy Spirit to face the giants in our lives. And so, Lord, as I conclude this worship experience today, I ask you, Lord, to touch the lives of those who've heard this message, those who are fighting depression, those who want to prevent depression, those who want to help somebody who is depressed. It's a giant in our country. It's a giant in the world. And so, Lord, today I pray for every individual under the sound of my voice. Bring wholeness to all of us. With heads bowed and eyes closed, there may be those of you who are not followers of Christ. And when I was greatly depressed, I was not a follower of Christ. I didn't have the hope of glory resident in me, and I didn't have the joy of the Lord in my life, so I had no peace in my life. Because the joy of the Lord was absent because I was away from the presence of the Lord. So I want to pray a simple prayer, and I want to ask those of you that have yet to pray a prayer to accept Christ as your Savior to pray this with me. So I want everyone here to pray it so that those here who may pray it for the first time don't have to pray it or say it alone. Those of you watching online will work the same for you right where you're at. You don't have to be in a church building to accept Christ. You could be anywhere. You don't have to be perfect because none of us are, and you won't be after you accept him. The simple truth is, give your life to him and see what happens. Pray this with me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I make you the Lord of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or you renewed your faith in Christ and you feel like you need to communicate that, please text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. The word SAVED, most powerful text you'll ever text in your life if you are a new Christian or a new follower of Christ. Text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. Okay, we want to hear from you. We look forward to celebrating with you. So please do that right now, watching online or in here. Please do that. At this time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. Yeah. Um, I want to, again, thank all of you. I, I am so always so appreciative of you giving, tithing, contributing to reaching the world here inside this building and the world outside this building. It is of extreme importance in a day where people are questioning their need for Jesus Christ. People literally are questioning their need for Jesus Christ because we have everything we need at our fingertips. You can, you can get food delivered to your door from almost Target, Walmart, almost any store now. They, you can get your food delivered, uh, your groceries delivered. You can get meals delivered. I mean, we've got everything at our fingertips. It's almost like, God, we've got it handled now. We're okay. The reality is that none of the things at our fingertips can fill our soul. Only Jesus can. And so this message that I'm preaching and roughly 400,000 other pastors in America are preaching and hundreds of thousands of more around the world are preaching is absolutely critical 
to our world. All of the chaos, all of the murders, all of the gun violence, everything you see. You know, we're arguing about things that we shouldn't be arguing about. You know, you can ban guns if you want. They'll figure out another way to kill people. This is not a gun issue. And those of you who think it is, I'm sorry, you're wrong. The reality is as long it's a man issue, it's a human issue, it's a people issue. And the only way for us to solve these problems is not taking things away, but putting Jesus in everyone's life. That will change the world. Why am I saying this during the offering? Because let me tell you something. Every month it takes us 55 plus thousand dollars to operate this organization. $55,000 a month to operate. Now, I know you don't think about that because you got your own issues at home. But unlike you, I've got my issues at home and i got this issue. And so I share it with you because I want us to share this issue because this is not my house. This is not your house. This is our house that God has allowed us to come together and worship in. And so, you know, I'm sure that when the bill comes for OG&E and your name is on it, you pay it. Or else it's dark in your house about 5.30. You know, every month the time comes for us to do it. And we all contribute because no name, none of your names are on it. But in heaven, I believe God looks and says our names are on this this, and we need to take care of it. And I really, really appreciate all of you saying this is my house too. And I want to help. So if you'd like to do that, and, you know, I can go back to the Bible and tell you all the reasons to give. And I'm just giving you the hardcore reason today. We've got to reach more people. And we're going to reach more people. That's just simple as that. So if you're writing a check, write it to Mosaic. If you want to give by text, you can give by texting 405-546-2226. Just text the word tithe or give to 405-546-2226. That's a different number than the previous number I gave you, so don't be confused. 405-546-2226, text the word give or tithe to that number, and you'll set up through a debit card or a credit card, and you can do it every time once it's set up. It's very simple from this point on. Also, you can still give by cash. It still works. I don't know how long it will, but it still does today. And you can uh, typically give online, which right now you cannot do uh, because our website is down. So hopefully this week it will be up and you'll be able to give there at mosaicokc.church. So I should just go ahead and pass the buckets. As they're passing the buckets, those of you who are here for the very first time, let me thank you for coming. Uh, we are fighting the flu with everything in us in our city. And uh, we did some research, Susan and I did yesterday, and it has hit the country. And uh, there are a few states that it's moderate, but our state is not moderate. It's high impact. And so we pray for all of you at home right now with, uh, with the flu, children with the flu. It is a big deal. Schools are uh, seeing a great drop in attendance uh, because of it. And so we're praying for all of you. Uh, so anyway, if this is your first time here, we're glad you came out in the cold, battled through the flu. And uh, please stop by the welcome kiosk to pick up a gift on your way out. Also, if you are a lady, it would be very, very helpful for our, our women's ministry. If you signed up for Beth Moore today, we need to know how much food to bring Wednesday night. Uh, and so please sign up on your way out at the welcome kiosk also. And uh, I'd like to ask you men to go ahead and sign up a week from this Wednesday. We will have our first men's gathering, Mosaic Men. So please sign up on your way out. Stand to your feet if you would, please. We're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.